So I was just having a conversation with one of the new So Apprentices and she asked me a question regarding a YouTuber that's like a gaming YouTuber. And she asked me this question and I'm like, oh no, I know the name of this YouTuber, but it, I can't remember it. Hold on, let me text the kids. And so I, you know, pick up my phone because they don't actually have real phones, right? They have an i, they have an iPad, and it doesn't like. But they learned how to text through the and the. You get it, anyway. And I text them, and the words that I texted were, "Hey, what is the name of the YouTuber that Scout used to watch that we don't watch anymore because she's transphobic?" And they immediately hit back with the answer, and then I realized how weird it is that I am texting a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old like that. And I'm just, my relationship with my mom was like definitely not like that. Granted, we did not have the technology and all the things that we have today. And also my mom has not been interested in anything tech like video games and stuff that my brother and I have always been interested in. So she would have not even known. Like, what's the YouTubes? She wouldn't have known. And so there is that, but it's still weird, right? That I'm just, hello, nine-year-old, let's talk about things that I don't let you do anymore because transphobic. It's weird. It's, 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 a, it's different raising kids in the 21st century, I think. And um, it's good. It's really good because there's so much awareness and that's really beautiful and so amazing. But on the other hand, is like this adult that's did not experience that at all. It's wild. That's it. That's the only story I have, because that just happened. And then I had to come in here to film, so it's on my brain. I will tell you what we are doing in just a minute, but before I do, hello, I'm Mrs. Soap and Clay. Let's make stuff. How's it going, Sudzers? Welcome back to the channel. You are at Soap and Clay, where we make all the soapy things. And you are here for day 228 of 365 days of soap. Today's recipe day. We are making beer soaps. Specifically, we are making the black and tan, which is an oatmeal stout and a honey ale, activated charcoal, uh, different types of clays for browning for the tan part, depending on the day but I'm going to give you a recipe and tell you about the clays that I used for this day, you know, now, because we haven't done a beer soap yet in 2022. Or I think maybe the entirety of year two on the channel. I don't know that we've actually done a beer soap recipe. So we're gonna do that thing today. So let's get to the video and we can talk all about the black and tan and beer soaps and how awesome they are, you know, there. Hey guys, happy Thursday. It really is Thursday, and I hope I'm going to be able to get this up in time. Now, this is a beer soap, okay, that I also put a couple soap nuts in. And as you can see, three soap nuts for this recipe for, well, um, a six pound batch of soap. So, that is what it is. Before we start talking about much of this, I'm going to give you the recipe. There it is. Stop. Screen cap do whatever, you know, they're your oils. 50% coconut oil, 35% olive oil, 15% shea butter. It is basically a two to one ratio with the water, but again, the water is beer. And I also included soap nuts in that. And while I was straining that, you also saw some interesting sediments 
that got strained out too. That was from the beer. The particular beer that I'm using, I think is very, very hoppy for, for this one. And I ended up with some interesting, you know, sediment on top. So it's always a good idea to strain if you're doing beer soaps. If you are new to beer soaps, you should freeze your beer into ice cube form and use the ice cubes, you know, weigh out the amount of liquid that you need for your recipe in ice cube form and then pour the sodium hydroxide over that and it melts the ice cubes and you still get your your exothermic reaction and you get your lye solution but it doesn't get as hot and it will be therefore less dangerous and therefore less likely to scorch from the sugars that are in the beers but for my part I literally never do that and I've shown you what can happen if things go awry and I, I mean I've done a lot of those videos so there's that now the soap nuts I am using in this because I want to, well, further up the awesomeness of the lather. There shouldn't really be much of a reason to up the awesomeness of this lather, though. A, because it's a beer soap. Two, because this recipe is 50% coconut oil. And that, generally speaking, produces a pretty big bubble. I have found, though, that with this particular recipe, when not making a beer soap, the lather is just sort of... Meh. And, um... A lot of that has to do with, well, the shea butter as well as the olive oil. We have done deep dives on all three of these oils, so go check out those those videos to see, you know, why that lather is interesting. And also, as you can tell within my, you know, ratings of conditioning and hardness and all the jazz, they're all, quote unquote, bad soaps, right? They're, they're bad in that they don't fall into the correct range. I pay zero attention to that to those numbers ever always 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 is what I'm going for I don't pay attention to those numbers and we've actually talked about why that is as well now for this bottom portion we're putting in copious amounts of activated charcoal which is cool the activated charcoal is a uh, very detoxifying for the skin it produces a very hard beautiful bar of soap it also does increase the lather and that's, you know, all good things. We like that across the board. Now, as I said, the reason that I included the soap nuts is because contrary to what this recipe stated, i.e. it's supposed to be big bubbly, it's not as bubbly as I would like. And I will actually show you the full bubble of this um, at some point in the video. I'm not real sure that I actually did a lather test on camera but I did just do lather picks for the website and the black and tan was one of the recipes that I'd used or one of the soaps that I just finished lather tests for. Now for the top portion of this, because this is my black and tan beer soap, I'm actually playing around with Fuller's Earth for the top portion. Normally I use a red clay or, or Moroccan clay you know something but I wanted to see what Fuller's Earth would do in this and if I would like the lather more than you know what I would normally see from this just using like a red clay so we're playing with that and for the scents with all of this the percentage usage that I use for both of these scents in a recipe like this is five percent and they are both uh, fragrances that can be used at those percentages so that's great that's great and Mad Micahs for the mica. that is the only downside to using the Fuller's Earth instead of using the red clay. The red clay normally is the natural colorant for this, just like the activated charcoal is the natural colorant for the bottom portion. But, you know, if it's a black and tan, I definitely want the top to be tan and not, you know, just a light creamy yellow. I already have a couple beer soaps that look like that so obviously the color in this instance should definitely match the name because that's what we do now with the add the addition of beers into soaps I have done a recipe before showing you what can happen as far as like separation and everything goes and that was an interesting video because I was 
doing a soap that the beer that I, I use for it, it always, always gets weird, right? And so I thought, well, this will actually be a good thing to, to show you because you get the separation, you get the ricing. And for this particular video, you're obviously not getting that. This beer has always played really well in my recipes. But just know if you are a first time beer soap maker and you experience acceleration or ricing or even seizing, not to freak out and throw it away. And again, go back and watch the video as to what happened with that soap and what it ended up looking like afterwards for you know more information on that. It's not the end of the world. I know it's scary to see, but it's super not, it's not going to hurt your soap. And also for the most part with beer soaps, this really is the process that you're going to get. It stays reasonably fluid. You can do some stuff with it. The batter is always very smooth. It's really not as scary as a lot of people like to make it out to be. So, you know, that's good. Let's go check out this cut. And again, I will show you pictures of the lather test. Oh my God, my phone is going off like crazy again. So there is the soap after it has sat in the mold for about 24 hours. It was sea popped and gelled because this is what I do. And also check out this lather. How beautiful that lather is. Also, yes, I learned how to use the background remover. And so that was fun. Canva is cool. And there's that big, beautiful, awesome lather that comes from this soap, this recipe. Rewind it. Check the soap if you don't believe me. That's what it is. It's a nice freaking lather. It's absolutely gorgeous. And again, this is a, another, like, I've said it before, but it always bears repeating. Don't pay too much attention to your numbers as far as the cleansing and conditioning and all of that jazz goes. It's, soap calc in and of itself is a good calculator but it has a whole lot of limitations and the things that it will never factor in will be things like the addition of beers and therefore sugars and what that does to the lather or the addition of soap nuts or the clays or all of those things the calculator does not factor that in and so if I were you I would steer clear of paying too terribly much attention to those recipes to the actual numbers for your fully formulated batch ever. I mean, it can be a nice guideline, sure. I check it every single time that I formulate a new recipe, absolutely. But I don't put much stock in what it actually means because it's not true to what my soaps ultimately end up performing like. So there's, there's that, really. Now, these particular soaps, some of the questions I get asked a lot with beer soaps is, do they smell like beer? Mine do because I want them to. Um, and they don't smell like, you know, cheap, gross, light beer or like beer in the alcoholic sense. They smell like the stuff that goes into beer. So this, for example, the black and tan, it's modeled after, you know, a black and tan. So an oatmeal stout and a honey ale. So those are the scent notes that I pull from to design the fragrances that go into them. And same thing for like an orange IPA. Well, I'm gonna put a little bit of kick of like effervescent bubblies, right? Like a beer. But for the most part, I'm really going to be leaning into the citrus notes to your grapefruit and all of that and your orange, really, and all of that jazz to create that blend. The soap in and of it themselves, if you put no scent in them, also do not smell like beer. They only smell like beer if you want them to, and if you want them to, you're actually actively having to put a scent in there to make it so. So, always a big question I get asked about beer soaps, for sure. One of the big questions I also get asked is, do you sub all or part of your water? And for this, I sub the entire amount of my water. So instead of using water at all in these recipes, I am using 100% beer. So all of the liquid that's supposed to be in the recipe, I put beer in instead. So there's that. And there's a whole bunch of black and tans. And you got to see the lather picture and it's amazing. And that is day 228. It's Thursday. It's also confusing because our last live was 229, but you know, there it is. And there they are, a whole lot of epic beer soaps with a whole lot of epic awesomeness. And I love the black and tans. My customers have loved the black and tans for several, several, several years. 
And so this is just the time of the year where everything gets restocked. And so we are making boatloads of the things. And I show you a little bit of the boatload making. And so there's a black and tan. Definitely check out the recipe. Try it for sure. If you have not made beer soaps before, it's not nearly as hard as people like to make it. It's not super scary. And because of the sugar content, as well as the hops and all kinds of things, which we did discuss in the video, beer soaps are good. It's definitely a cool thing to include in your line, if only for label appeal, if you want to reach that market, but also because the skin loving benefits of a beer soap, absolutely off the chain. So yeah, definitely check it out. If you make the recipe, let me know how you liked it. I always love engaging with Sudzers after they've made something and we troubleshoot if anything goes wrong, but you know, yeah, do that. That would be excellent. If you're interested in, you know, more daily content and more recipes and more all the thing things, subscribe. That's awesome. For the Sudzers who have subscribed, hello Sudzers, thank you for being here. You're awesome and I appreciate you each and every day. Today is obviously no exception. I am out of here for today though, but I will see you guys all again tomorrow for another round of Soapy Fun. Bye.